Okay, we are ready to get rock and rolling. Um, thank you all for joining today. My name is Patty Elliott, and I am the CSO of Investments here at Lighter Capital. And I welcome you all to our second webinar in our Founders Series. Um, the goal of the series really is to provide guidance to our companies and to the broader startup community um, as we all work towards um, working through the pandemic and in building our business for growth. Um, at the last webinar, we conducted a survey to all the attendees and asked of you what was important that um, you hear from Lighter Capital. And there was a overwhelming response that stated you wanted to hear more about funding options that are available in today's current environment. So today I have invited um, three elite panelists um, to talk a little bit about uh, their operations. Um, and then the three different companies are also going to talk about the differences between all three of us. Uh, the format today of the webinar is Q&A. Uh, we want to make it very casual um, and have a conversation. Um, and so we are encouraging all of you to ask as many questions as possible. You'll see at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A box. Simply click that and add your questions there. And our goal today is to try to answer as many questions as possible from our panelists. Um, so let's have some fun. Let's look at some funding options to help you fuel your growth. Um, and I would first like to introduce um, our first panelist, and that is Min Lee with Silicon Valley Bank. Um, Min is a marketing manager, the marketing manager for SVB based here out of the headquarters in Seattle. Um, he serves as a banking partner for technology, life science, and clean technology companies in all different stages. Uh, Men is deeply involved in the Washington entrepreneurial and venture capital communities um, and has advised countless of companies today in raising capital and debt financing. Men has been with Silicon Valley Bank since 2008, and he worked previously at Square One Bank, which is now Western uh, Bank, acquired in March 2015. And so with that, Min, I'll hand it off to you if you want to give a quick overview of Silicon Valley Bank. Yeah, hey, thanks. Um, thanks for having me. Really glad to be here. And uh, I appreciate you guys motivating me to wear a button-up shirt for the first time in a few months. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, so Silicon Valley Bank's been around for about 35 years. We're um, a global commercial bank focused on the innovation ecosystem. And so we're, we're working with entrepreneurs and with investors to really help them push ideas forward quicker. Um, you know, what a lot of folks know us for and what we do a lot of is really connecting entrepreneurs with, um, you know, with, with the right connections on the equity side, um, with unique capital sources, um, including debt sources from our, ourselves, and then uh, providing them advice, just given a lot of the data and information we have with all the focus we have in the industry. That's great. Thanks, man. I'm so glad that you're here today with us. We've been partnering um, and working with Silicon Valley Bank for many years now. Um, and um, we certainly have enjoyed working with you, men. Um, okay, next on our panel is um, Meredith Powell. Meredith is a venture partner at Voyager Capital. Uh, Meredith is an award-winning serial entrepreneur go-to-market specialist and connected, very well connected in the tech community. Um, Meredith focuses on new investments and business development. And as a founder of three companies, as an active partner, board member, and trusted strategic advisor. She provides guidance to early stage companies um, and large corporations alike, and has successfully uh, navigated tomorrow's exceptional economy. It's a pleasure having you today here, Meredith. I know the attendees will have many questions for you. Uh, tell us what's going on with Voyage Capital. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much, Patty. Right, so Voyager Capital is a 20-year-old fund. Uh, we're focused on investing in B2B software across the Pacific Northwest. So we have offices in Portland, also Vancouver, BC, and the bulk of our team is in Seattle, Washington. 
we, um, we most recently closed our $100 million fund five. Um, and we focus on investing at the sort of seed and series A stage. So, you know, a typical Voyager round would be um, us leading and syndicating a series A uh, that's usually bringing like a one to $4 million check to the table and then potentially following on from there. Um, as Patty, as you mentioned, we are a team of past operators, so we get it. Uh, we are all past founders ourselves. We love working with founders. As you mentioned, I'm a three-time founder personally, and our special sauce is very much bringing that sort of go-to market support, as well as high performance leadership development and uh, executive coaching to the table. So we have nearly 100 investments um, at Voyager Capital so far, and we're very actively investing now in a fund five. Thank you, Meredith. It's a pleasure to have you here today. And our third panelist is our very own Zach Homey. Um, uh, Zach is Vice President of Strategic Partnerships here at Lighter Capital. He's been with us a little over four years, right, Zach? Um, he has a very successful, proven um, financial background in the financial services industry um, and has worked with many of our SaaS platform customers. Um, Zach, uh, before Lighter Capital, Zach was with JP Morgan Chase and Wells Fargo. So welcome, Zach. Tell us a little bit about Lighter Capital. Yeah, thanks everybody. Lighter Capital has been working really hard to revolutionize startup financing. We work uh, to make it easy for entrepreneurs to quickly access up to $3 million in growth capital with zero dilution and full control on how to use the funds. Um, our platform pulls in about 6,500 data points on average for an opportunity and we use pr proprietary algorithms to determine a credit rating and a use data science to predict the startup's revenue growth. And on average, we're seeing about a 97% accuracy there. Um, Lighter Capital has invested $225 million um, in 700 rounds of financing across 400 companies in the US and in Canada. Thanks, Patty. Thanks, Zach. Okay, so um, let's kick off, uh, uh, start a questioning here. And again, we encourage everybody to uh, type in your questions there in the Q&A box listed below on your screen. Um, so the first question I have is for you, Meredith, and that is, so what is going on in the marketplace right now? What is your general sentiment um, among seed and growth stage VCs? What is, what, what's being said out there? Sure. Sure. Well, I think for, for my purposes, I would, I'll probably speak a little bit more to the earlier stage. Um, so like seed to series A, uh, you know, we know at the growth stage, and there's certainly fantastic growth VCs, you know, a company typically has a little more predictability uh, in their business. Whereas, you know, a lot of the companies that we're working with in the early stage, they're really vulnerable right now. So, you know, step one, certainly for us and for colleagues, you know, that we're talking to other VCs at early stage was really to uh, dig in with our portfolio companies, which has meant a lot of reforecasting, you know, uh, this last stretch, everybody's been re-looking at their budgets, looking at their churn, looking at their burn, thinking about, you know, what a scenario A, B, C could be. So that was kind of step one for us. And I, and I think for everyone else as well, just to um, sort of dig in with a portfolio. You know, and then the other piece is around deal flow. And I think, you know, we're seeing uh, some early stage VCs have really just taken a step back for a minute. And I think with good reason um, to just, you know, see the market sort of try and get out of the weeds a little bit, get a, above sort of and see down into the market and look at where the opportunities will lie. Um, we have taken a bit of a, a different approach at Voyager in that we have been actively investing during this time. Um, so probably the most interesting deal uh, we announced was just in May, actually, an investment in a fabulous company called Cindio, which is a pay equity platform. And we did the deal without ever having um, met the founder in person or stepping into an office. We did it all virtually. So I think for any founders on the call who are you know, thinking about venture capital right now, while there are um, some pauses, certainly, um, and some checks being written, please do know that there are uh, VCs out there who are actively looking at deals and, um, you know, we're all just managing as best we can here. That's great. Thank you, Meredith. Okay, Min, um, can you uh, describe some of the lending products that SVB offers to startups and maybe a little bit about how each of those products differ from each other? 
Sure. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll try to focus just given the topic is more on SaaS companies today. I'll focus around that. Um, I'd say there's two primary products that early stage SaaS companies um, look at for debt financing. The first would be venture debt, which is typically reserved for those SaaS companies that are venture backed. Um, and it's a, you know, what you consider a term loan. And so a loan that has um, a defined uh, repayment um, kind of schedule. And so those are typically 48 month, month facilities where they put them in place. They have some period of time to draw on them, you know, call it, you know, six to 12 months. Um, and then when they draw it down, it amortizes over kind of the rain, remainder of that period. So, um, um, you know, those are really flexible facilities. They're not tied to, you know, any MRR metrics or any AR, you know, kind of at, asset backed, um, you know, kind of measures. Um, super flexible. It's kind of just a cheap way of supplementing equity to get more runway. And then the other, the other uh, facility that folks use, um, it's typically when they're a little bit more scaled is uh, SaaS uh, recurring revenue lines. And so that is a, a line of credit that allows you to basically uh, borrow on, on recurring revenue. And so typically it's three time multiple on recurring revenue, three to three to four times. Um, typically, there's a, a measure that is tracked for churn or um, growth rate that would determine what that multiplier looks like. And so if, you know, SaaS metrics decline, the multiplier will decline as well. Um, and it's a way for companies really to accelerate on, you know, the customer acquisition costs that they have to, to bring in new customers. Interesting. Thank you, man. Um, and Zach, um, we've got a question here. Can you outline a little bit about our financial products um, and how they're different from what men just described on the bank side? Yeah, so um, a, a little bit of variance um, in the way we target um, startup funding is generally speaking, we'll, we'll come in a little bit earlier, um, kind of think of it as a lending continuum and um, they're, you know, in the very early stages of post-revenue business life, um, lighter capital can get started underwriting once a company hits about 15 or 20 K in monthly revenue. Um, and we're really underwriting to the historical performance of the business. Um, and so we want to see some revenue trend and revenue history. And then the SaaS metrics as well, if it's a, if it's a SaaS company or, or something broadly speaking under the tech umbrella. And, um, and when we get started, we're um, looking at if there's a working capital need or a growth capital need in the business. And then as such, if there's a working capital need, we might look at putting together a line of credit offering for the business. If it's more of a growth need and they're trying to put some more fuel on the fire, then um, we might look at a term loan or one of our revenue-based financing products. Um, the revenue-based financing operates similarly to a term loan, but there's a royalty payback instead of a fixed monthly payment. Pat, Patty, you're on mute. Patty, you're on mute. Uh, maybe I'll just add to, to Zach's comment in terms of like a little bit of, of distinguishing between what Lighter Capital does, yeah. which um, which I think is very complementary to what we do. I think um, on the on the non venture back side, I completely agree that like Lighter Capital is a, a, a great resource to come in where um, the company's a little too early for us um, to do a re recurring revenue line. Um, however, you know, on our venture debt lines, we'll do, you know, we'll work with pre-revenue companies that have raised a, a you know, VC round. So we'll get in pretty early in the venture debt side, um, you know, versus the, the SaaS lending side where we're, we're probably looking at companies, if they're non-venture backed companies that are, you know, in the five plus million in, in revenue level. Okay. Got it. Um, thank you for that. Um, um, one of the other questions that has come in, Meredith, um, is um, how should CEOs be managing growth versus runway in this environment? Yeah, that's such a complex question. You know, I think a lot of it comes down to what area of business you're in, right? Like, so on the one hand, right now, we are seeing um, certain ventures get hit really hard, right? Of course, if you are in the travel space, if you're selling into hospitality, like there are certain uh, industries where growth will be extremely challenging right now and you might be shifting your business in one way. On the flip side, you know, we have all seen 
anyone who's followed like Zoom stock or Microsoft Teams or Square or Shopify, we've seen explosive growth in certain areas. So interestingly, you know, I've been speaking to say us sort of digging in with our portfolio. We have, you know, some companies where I think strategically, this is a moment where they should um, step back from that growth piece and really think about runway and when their next fundraise is coming. And if that means, you know, going work from home or remote or reducing their burn in some way, um, certainly t &E has gone down for all of our companies. That's really important. In other cases, we actually think this is the moment to step on the gas. So I realize that's a very roundabout, the, you know, everyone's looking for the one solution, but actually I think it's really important to look at what market you're in you know, what area of the business you're selling into, are you selling into HR, are you selling into, you know, DevOps, you know, what, what is, what is your expertise and then really thinking strategically with your board, with your team about whether this is a moment for growth, because for some companies, this is actually a moment of explosive growth. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you, Meredith. Um, and so we have a question from the audience. What is the ratio of recurring revenue versus project base? that you look at for funding? And I guess this may be for men or Zach. Yeah, I don't know if I answer, understand the question. What's the, I don't, I don't know if I understand the project based side of it. Yeah, I, I, I can, I'm happy to jump in and just tee off. Um, so at Lighter Capital, we do a lot of focus um, in our underwriting around how much of the revenue is recurring. Um, you know, we can work with SaaS and tech um, especially managed services or tech enabled services companies that do project work as well. Um, if there's a lot of project based revenue, we'll just want to see how often those existing clients are, are re engaging for new projects. Um, if it's truly recurring, that's a little easier for us. And then we're looking at, you know, churn concentration, those, those types of metrics when we look at our underwriting. Um, but I wouldn't say there's a key milestone in terms of the mix, but it is a little bit easier for us to wrap around um, the underlying metrics as it pertains to MRR, ARR, and true recurring revenue relative to, um, you know, projects, especially if they're a little more ad hoc and the clients churn on and off, um, depending on the need for the project. Yeah, okay, I get it. Uh, yeah, I, I would just say for us, we, we definitely lean in more, much more on the, on the true recurring revenue side of things, where we'll, you know, where we'll lend and it's not true recurring revenue, um, I'd say is less on the project slash service side, but might be on a on a repeatable revenue base, right? And so that might be transact, you know, some transactional you know, fee side of things where, you know, it's it's um, it's not contracted recurring revenue, but like you have you know, a history of repeating revenue. We can you know we can work with that as well. Thank you, men. Okay, we have another question here, uh, Corey from Haas Alert. Taking a SBA EIDL loan from the federal government, does that have a negative appearance on an early stage business? I guess. I guess I'll, yeah, yeah, I can take that one. Yeah, I mean, we don't, yeah, we don't, yeah, we, I mean, like we've, we've got companies that have PPP loans. We have companies that are going to be pursuing those loans, the EIDL loans as well. And, yeah, we don't look at them as a bad thing, right? I mean, a lot of the, a lot of what what companies are going through right now and are seeking some of these resources for are things that are, you know, are really out of their control. Like they didn't they didn't cause these issues, and you know, they're seeking ways to um, where the government is supporting um, these companies through the and navigating through these issues. And you know, so those are absolutely not a bad thing. Now, there's some complications to um, some of these loans that that you have to work through, right? From a from a seniority basis and who, yeah. who owns the collateral, who's going to get repaid first and, and et cetera. And so like, those are things that you just gonna have to work through with your senior lender. Thank you, man. Um, uh, another question from the audience here, uh, are professional services retainers with defined periods looked at similar to terms of financing to SAS recurring revenue? So I guess it's contracted periods with um, SAS um, uh, service retainers. And does that debt look or revenue look the same as recurring revenue? That's what I'm thinking, Donnie, who has asked this question here. Yeah, I can speak on behalf of lighter capital. So um, depending on the nature of the underlying contract, if it's a retainer um, with an intent for usage um, where the, the services will be utilized 
and it's expected to be utilized, we could potentially look at that more as kind of like an annual upfront contract. Um, it, it really just depends on the nature of the relationship um, and and how much utilization and therefore revenue realization will be over the period of, over the retainer period. Um, again, anything that looks and feels a lot like tr traditional SaaS recurring revenue, it's going to be easier for us to correlate to how we underwrite that sort of revenue. Thank you. Yeah, I don't have much to add there. I mean, I think you know, you know, in those contracts, that there are performance measures that like might jeopardize some some of the the payment inflows. That you know, that we would look at that um, in a in a in a worse way than we would a traditional SaaS kind of recurring revenue line. I would sense. say also just from a venture capital. Meredith, you're on mute. Uh, I think, sorry, Meredith, we got you muted. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, just from a venture capital perspective, that we're all very aligned here, that um, everything that Zach and Min have said about thinking about sort of recurring revenue and thinking about services or consulting work or a special sort of out-of-scope work, that venture capital would see that in exactly the same way. Got it. Thank you, Meredith. Um, we also have another question uh, for Min here. Um, um, what advice from SVB team on fundraising. Um, how do I get started to take advantage of the services you offer? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, the first thing is to set up an account with us, right? And so, like, you know, for, for us, we'll spend time to work with entrepreneurs to kind of review their plan. Um, you know, usually they'll have a fundraising deck. They'll pull together materials. We may introduce, like, if they are having issues pulling together the materials, we may introduce them to some folks that might be able to help them with that. We have, you know, some partners, particularly particularly on the on the CFO type side, that may come in and help them with forecasting and you know, those types of things. And then, and then we typically will work with those companies to to um, really suss out the investor landscape in terms of like where where their space is and what kind of investors are investing in those space, and then make kind of warm introductions. But you know, first and foremost is like begin the working relationship allow us to get to know you, allow us to build kind of, um, you know, kind of a track record with you um, and understand the business so that we can really figure out who the right investors are and make those introductions. Question um, out there, the attendees, thank you. Um, and we have another uh, question here. Uh, is there any, um, this is for you, Meredith, any VC invest investments in Africa? Uh, would it be considerable? Gosh, that is outside of the scope of uh, the work that we do. So I, you know, I don't want to speak out of turn, but I can't imagine, you know, why not? Like certainly there are VCs that are investing globally and looking for opportunities globally. Um, but I, yeah, I don't know if I have a, a real finger on the pulse truly of, of, you know, what the, what the right answer to that is. You got it. Um, and, um, and, and to that point, Meredith, we had the same question or uh, just to look at the geographic scope of Voyager Capital. Um, are you restricted to the Northwest in Canada or nationwide? Yeah, so we take a very regional approach to our investment thesis. We invest in Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, and Alberta and Canada. So we call it like Western Canada or Pacific Northwest focus. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question here. Thanks guys for uh, filing them in. This is very much a conversation, which is what we had hoped. <clears throat> um, Next question is, we are a technology SaaS that has executed a relaunch on the business distribution channel and cap table in January. We raised our first small seed offering in March and have been building out the technology, including A, and launching a professional services division. My question is, how do we really show value and customer acquisition transaction? slow right now due to the state of the economy for our next round, which we are targeting for the fall. Or I guess really all three of you, um, what they really want to, the question appears to be, um, 
how do you show value in acquiring customers? So that's on the book of the business, right? But when they go for their second round of funding, uh, which they're targeting for the fall, how do we look at that? Um, yeah, I'm happy to tee off. I mean, again, we're not equity investors at Lighter, but we work with a lot of companies that have taken VC capital. Um, I would say that um, definitely given that you've had a seed round, working with your seed investors to determine what sort of milestones would be in place, for, you know, based on their opinion to, to, uh, to execute a successful A and secure a lead investor on the A. Um, but yeah, definitely working with your existing investors to see, you know, based on their professional opinion, because they know the business very well, obviously, as existing investors, what they think you guys need to accomplish in order to get a successful Series A in the fall. Um, and and you know, again, I, that's kind of a broad answer, but that could be a myriad of different, you know, performance metrics or um, milestones with the product itself. Um, it, it could be a myriad of things. Uh, just depending on what the intent um, is when you go to raise the A and, and the story you're crafting for the business and where it's going. Great. Yeah, I can jump in. I think that's great advice that Zach gave, certainly, because, uh, you know, the people who are already in the business are going to be the most knowledgeable about how you're running your business today. The other thing that might be interesting to think about is, uh, you know, I think this entrepreneur is talking about raising money in the fall. Now, Looking ahead, um, there is some feeling that there might be some challenges around um, raising funding in the fall uh, on a few different fronts, not just related to the pandemic, but also upcoming elections and sometimes some uncertainty there. So I would suggest if there's a short list, for example, of, of uh, funds that this entrepreneur would like to ideally raise money from in the fall, it would be a great suggestion to actually start broaching some of those conversations now and ask that question to so say, when I come back to you in September, or October, November, whenever, whenever that is, what are the metrics you would like to see from, from our company? You know, what can we show to you so that when we come back to you, we get, you know, that yes from, you know, you can have those conversations now. In fact, most VCs are sitting at home, so we're more reachable than usual. <sighs> yeah, uh, just, just building on that, the, the other thing that I would say is like, I think the challenge to Meredith's point is very real in terms of raising capital. I think there's a ton of uncertainty in the equity markets for raising a Series A or, you know, or beyond. Um, and uh, at that stage, you know, it, it oftentimes is better for you to try to get insider money to push out as long as you can. I know a lot of the, the, the companies that we work with, certainly over the last couple of months or few months, have been doing anything they can do to, to get, you know, runway out to 18, 24, 36 months. Um, and so trying to raise in the next six months or this year, that's a really difficult ask. Yes, thank you, men. Uh, another question that is coming in, and thanks team out there, uh, attendees continue to ask away here. Um, and the question from George is, is the enterprise valuation still using EBITDA multiple for SaaS firms? What is the range? Meredith might be the best person on the equity side, but like general, I mean, if you're talking about public companies potentially, but like a lot of, a lot of the SaaS companies that we're looking at that are raising money at the early to mid stage are all still, if it's high growth is, is um, really around revenue multiples, not EBITDA multiples. In fact, most of those companies don't have EBITDA. I mean, they do what they do. It's just negative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, agreed. Okay, um, and um, we have another question. Um, how favorably do you view the municipal sector as a software market with SaaS that competes or outperforms with Info and Oracle, in, yeah, Info and Oracle versus industrial or consumer markets? So is there a different view on software companies um, versus uh, software market in the municipal sector versus um, SaaS companies that uh, are uh, a subset of Oracle um, or industrial consumer markets? Sounds like more B2B versus consumer. 
I mean, at Voyager Capital, we invest in B2B software only, and we feel like that's a, that's a great space for us to play, but that's, um, you know, we, we don't do any consumer deals if that's, if they're sort of looking for a comparison between, you know, B2B and B2C. So maybe, maybe Min or Zach would be a better fit for that one. Yeah. Um, I was thinking more to the extent of like B2G versus B2B or B2C and, um, the municipal sector specifically in the question. And, um, you know, if it's government um, contracts, those can be very sticky, very great for long-term stable growth. I know that um, if a company is looking for a line of credit, sometimes uh, lenders don't like to collateralize government receivables. So that, that can be an issue in some situations as well. But, um, but you know, if a company can start in a B2G environment and then pivot to more broadly going after, you know, a commercial market, that, that's another great way to start building a business, at least that we've seen historically. Thank you. Nothing more to add. Okay, thanks, Min. Uh, so the question uh, that came in, um, just to follow up on my question, this applies uh, to VC, Meredith. What would, let's see, what would it take to be considered for a VC investment uh, for Africa? We are a payment facilitator. Uh, sorry, a v, what would be considered for a VC investment? In oh, right. I, um, I think the, the attendee is looking for, um, uh, and what I would recommend, it sounds like Meredith, is that this individual is looking um, for a possible uh, connection that does investments in Africa, and maybe mm -hmm. we can get that to sure. you. And surely um, they're going to have some parameters um, that um, they would quickly send to you in applying. And I hope right, sure. Well, geographies do, I mean, ventures do tend to grow uh, differently in each geography. For example, even between Canada and the US, we see funding round sizes are a little bit different. Um, and, you know, some great resources, like even just hopping on Crunchbase or AngelList, you know, as starting places, that would, I would say for this entrepreneur, those are some pretty, you know, handy places where you could start out and just search by regional VCs and start finding, you know, investors that would specialize in a particular area. And even, you know, some of those databases will actually also indicate the specific areas where they're investing. So not just the region, but, you know, if there's a particular area. So for example, you might find um, an investor out of London, you know, in the UK, but they might invest in Africa. Um, I would suggest those are probably the first two stops that I would take just to start doing a little bit of research and then certainly LinkedIn is everyone's best friend yeah. I would say from there you know there's there's uh, ways of reaching out or even just uh, reaching out on Twitter too investors are often very happy to respond and engage that way thank you Meredith okay um, the questions continue to come in which is fantastic um, I am with a bootstrap profitable SaaS company with 550,000 MRR. Founders are not interested in venture capital funding. What do you suggest for growth debt? Sorry, Meredith. <laughs> <laughs> so Zach? Uh, yes. So um, again, if you're bootstrapped and you don't have VCs um, sponsoring the company to date, uh, lighter capital could potentially be an option, especially at that MRR level. Um, just depending on what the company is looking for. Um, you know, we're obviously going to want to know what your use of funds are and how you're planning to spend the money to grow the company, although we won't dictate that once the loan is issued. Um, so so we, we could be an option. Uh, given that the company is profitable, SBA funding could also be an option, um, depending on how much uh, true cash flow you're generating. Um, small business banking could potentially be an option. Um, again, just in the context of a profitable business that... Um, that uh, is cash flowing already, but doesn't have any kind of equity representation on the cap table from a VC or, or, um, or another institution like a PE. Yeah, and I, I, I just add that we would even take a look at that. At that scale, we would take a look at it too. Got it, thank you, Min. Um, and a question for Lighter Capital. We are a SaaS early stage with several launch customers going live over the next three months. Lighter Capital could let us delay a venture round, which would be favorable to us. The question is, Lighter, is Lighter an alternative for us until we take a Series A VC money? 
Um, just in terms of uh, the fit relative to the company's profile that Patty um, just walked us through, uh, generally speaking, again, we'd want to see some kind of historical revenue. So if you guys had these customers on a paid beta, um, we could potentially extrapolate that, especially if all of them were expected to convert into full clients um, after MVP and launch. Um, so we could potentially be um, a fit for a business like that, just depending on um, uh, what the revenue generation has been um, you know, prior to going live, so to speak, for the question. Thank you, Zach. Um, and this question comes from John. Uh, what are the funding recommendations for a purely service-based company? Well, if we're looking at a service-based company, then I would say venture capital is probably um, not the, the first stop that you would make. Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll bow out of this one further than that. Yeah, maybe men? Yeah, I mean, it, I, you know, that really depends on the profile of the business, if it's profitable, what the revenue scale is, et cetera. I mean, and if it's, if it's tech-enabled services, that's different than just like peer services. Um, you know, we, we um, will work with tech-enabled services companies. We'll, you know, we generally won't work with peer services businesses. We're, you know, the, the margins aren't the profile that we like. The growth rate typically isn't there. Um, and, uh, you know, so... I'd say traditional banks, if you're profitable and are, are you know, at reasonable scale. And for lighter, I'd echo Min's comments. If it's tech enabled services, um, we could potentially be a fit. If it's pure traditional services, depending on the nature of the business, um, a, a traditional banking solution, if, assuming the ca company's cash flowing, might be a, a good option. Thank you, Zach. Um, and uh, another question from John. Let's see, oh, we have answered that. Um, is there a different app, uh, is, there, is there different technology applications for a service firm? I think it's somewhat the same question that was asked before um, as far as the application side, which I think you guys did a great job of kind of answering that. Okay, Meredith, here's another question for you. So at this time, what metrics are you most concerned with? Um, and what, what is Voyager Capital kind of continuing to look at? Is there certain metrics that, that are important to you during this time? Yeah, I mean, certainly uh, when we're looking at our own portfolio, like we're looking at burn really, really closely and just trying to minimize in any way. I think it came up earlier on the call that we're really recommending for everyone that we meet with, like to have at least 18 months runway. So the reality is many of the ventures that we're seeing do not have 18 months runway today. So, you know, trying to get on a path to having that extra sort of flexibility is really important. Um, and then, you know, we're also, you know, we're looking at churn for sure, because certain, you know, certain buyers are, uh, they're having their budgets cut. And so for example, um, HR, like a lot of companies that are selling to HR right now, um, there's, you know, a lot of cuts in HR, a lot of cuts in marketing. So we're looking at that and sort of how to retain customers, you know, as, as strongly as possible. And then, you know, another thing that's popped up is we're starting to see a lot of like aging AR within our businesses. So, you know, again, depending on who they're selling into, again, we're all B2B, you know, certain industries are hurting. So if you are selling into the travel industry and then all of a sudden they're getting backed up and they're not paying their bills, this is something we're paying really close attention to and is not something that typically is a huge issue for our company. So we're, we've got a real drill down on that too and just making sure that, you know, if there's a lot of outstanding uh, accounts receivable, um, that there's a strategy around that. Thank you, Meredith. Um, another question here. We are a B2B to C SaaS company in our seed round. We are onboarding end users through customers and should be at 200K to 300K users by Q4. We don't plan on implementing um, features till Q2 2021. What KPIs are you looking from end users to prove its usefulness, stickiness, or value during this time period? It's a good question, huh? Did I catch, are the users paid or are they free? I think um, they're free, free users. Um, so they're adopting users without revenue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
well, user growth, of course, is, you know, that continues to be important. Uh, I would say it'd be interesting to think about what, what paid looks like. Again, I, without knowing much about the details of the company, it's sometimes, you know, challenging to offer direction. But, you know, if they were even lightly paid, if they turned on, you know, a light payment, are those, will those customers stay with them? Or will they churn out? Uh, you know, that would be interesting. And, you know, their retention numbers, again, would be very interesting. They might be very successful at onboarding, but, you know, are those customers staying with them over time? Do those users stick with the product or not? Like, those would all be interesting things to look at. That's great. Great. Thank you, Meredith. Um, men, so uh, what uh, are some type of lending products as B offers to startup? And you, you covered that, which is great. But, um, you know, what does the bank offer as in way of um, resources to help a startup scale um, and their capital needs take off? Yeah, I mean, I think we touched on a little bit in terms of like the connections and resources that, that we provide, right? We, you know, um, organizationally, we, we both help work with companies and entrepreneurs. Um, we also have the largest global venture capital private equity practice. So, the venture capital firms are clients too. And so, you know, it's, it's a, it's a nice um, client base and just kind of network within the SVB platform that allows us to be able to connect folks to the right investors at the right time. Um, and then it's not uncommon for us like to have technology companies trying to sell into other tech companies. We work with companies, you know, across all stages. You know, if you think about like one of the data points that I, I dug up not too long ago for this call was just kind of understanding our client base a little better. And, one of the interesting stats was that of the venture back companies that have gone public in 2019, we, we banked just shy of 70% of those companies. And so we work with a lot of large technology companies that are potential buyers to other, other clients of ours. And so, you know, how we connect clients to clients to be able to help, you know, both validate technology, but also create customer opportunities is something that's pretty interesting that we do. Thank you. Thank you, man. Um, that's great. This question is for Meredith. Uh, we are a SaaS-based social media marketing and branding platform. We will launch our MVP next month, and we're looking to raise money. We have no debt. We bootstrap the entire initial development of our platform. What suggestions do you have for us? Well, I guess uh, I would wonder, suggestions on product or per perhaps suggestion on fundraising, I'm going to, I'll take a fundraising path uh, and hopefully that's um, the right direction. So, you know, bootstrapping, this is pretty common. We see lots of companies that, you know, from a, or an early stage, you know, they're, they're bootstrapping and then there's a point, oh, I think we've got some added, um, sorry. Then there's a point where, you know, you're looking to sort of raise a first round. So, I mean, congratulations on having the MVP ready to, to rock. I would say, you know, at this point, you're really just trying to have as many conversations as possible and tell as many people as possible about what you're working on. Um, and I think that because you're so early stage, you know, you're well positioned to do that. Although, you know, you mentioned not having any debt. This is a really relevant conversation here that actually uh, in BC, like we, we are not averse to, you know, if you have taken on some debt or, you know, any loans or even uh, we were talking about financial relief earlier that came up. Um, those are not no-nos in, in venture capital land. Like whatever you need to do to build your business is what you need to do. And if we see growth and we see opportunity over time, um, then certainly from a venture capital perspective, we would be interested in taking a look at the company. Um, so I would just say, try and arrange as many coffees as possible right now. Try and meet as many people as possible, you know, grow your platform. But from a fundraising perspective, just start having conversations um, everywhere you can. Thank you, Meredith. Okay, the questions continue to come in, which is terrific. Um, this is from Scott. Uh, in early stage health IT startups, uh, determining valuations is difficult to determine. Is there a basic formula you use to determine valuation based on market size, recurring revenue, and projected lifetime value? Or are there other variables? Um, to date, we have found more interest in valuation acceptance from our strategic partners other than VCs. We're concerned that we are not driving our value proposition to VCs or not focusing on the right valuation methodologies. Any thoughts on that? Uh, 
Well, I would say from, from our perspective, like valuation is very much a discussion that occurs not only within our partnership, but in collaboration with the founders and potentially any prior investors. So I know everyone looking for the magical like valuation tool, um, but you know, for us, we're, we're more interested in being aligned with the founders, having you know, aligned core values, aligned uh, goals for the company, you know, and being able to create value ourselves for the founders. And for us, like the valuation conversation comes a little bit uh, later, actually, um, as we sort of work the work out the deal. Um, yeah. Thank you, Meredith. Um, and another question that we have, uh, when you look at, when you look to offer a funding source, which is more important to you? financial performance projections, management team, customer base, or other? Kind of, it, we're getting into somewhat the same theme here, but of the three, you know, men, what, what would be important? What is the first priority? Boy, Boy it's like, yeah, I mean, that's the, um, they're all, like, if, if any one of those are terrible, like, I don't know if we would do the deal. And so it's a pretty challenging question. I guess the financial, you know, for, for a SaaS business, that is looking for a SaaS line, probably financial performance. If you're a venture debt company, you may not like, again, you may be pre-revenue, right? And there's just not a whole lot there on the financials. And we're looking at like investors and management team and market size and, um, and what you plan to do, track you to that. Um, but I guess on a, on a, for a SaaS business, we're looking at financial performance a fair bit and then um, and looking at those metrics. I think, in fact, like Min hit on something really interesting, which is the growth piece, right? Like if we're looking at a growth stage company, then um, management team is often shifting and you can actually attract exceptional talent. And so we're less concerned with the management team, for example, but we are very concerned with financial performance in the customer base. At the early stage, a lot of our work is, you know, betting on founders and building relationships with exceptional you know, entrepreneurs. So then we do have a lot of weight on the management team. So it definitely depends on where you land within the, like the life cycle of your business. Excellent. Thank you, Meredith. Just to piggyback on, on that. I think that especially for a growth stage company, if you have the numbers, if you have the historical financial performance, that's an indicator that the management team knows what they're doing and that the customer base, you know, is satisfied with the product. So, you know, at least for us, I would just, I would say that you know, seeing it in the financials is proof in the pudding that the company's working and it's growing. Thank you, Zach. Uh, another question here, what type of current valuations are you seeing for early stage pre or minimum revenue SaaS companies? Have they decreased during the current crisis? Have you seen a, a, a decrease? Um, I mean, I've definitely seen valuations go down. I mean, I don't have, um, you know, it's been a few months, right? So like, I, I don't have a ton of data points, but valuations are definitely coming down um, for companies. And, you know, my, my sense is it's still, you know, for if you have the right metrics, growth metrics, which is, again, challenged in this environment where, you know, six, nine months ago, you might have forecasts that uh, it, with financials that are showing you able to grow 100% year over year. Everybody forecast has forecasted down to you know half of that at best, and so um, I think it's a part of it is is driven by the metrics. Like the metrics got to be down, and so the valuations are going to be down. Um, but like you're seeing for for decent SaaS businesses, still kind of six to eight times revenues. Yeah, I would say we're also seeing more flat rounds. So companies in an early stage who would have anticipated that if they go to raise a little bit more that they're going to have an up round. And in fact, in today's environment, they need they they need that investment. And so they're just going with maybe not a down round, but a, a flat round just to get the deal done. Got it. Got it. Thank you. OK, um, as we round out to the top of the hour. Um, uh, let's see. Another question um, here, uh, Meredith, for you. So which areas of burn are easiest to spin up again in the recovery? Oh, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, during, during this time, we've seen uh, most startups go work from home, right? Which is an interesting way to not only um, address 
you know, the pandemic, but also it's cut a lot of costs for a lot of the companies we're working with. I mean, the thing that will actually be quite fascinating is to see how many companies do go back to a traditional office. And for many businesses, especially our early stage startups, they're actually, you know, many of them are considering uh, continuing with work from home. So that might be, that might be something, you know, from the bottom line that, that changes actually in their, their burn. I mean, and certainly we talked a little bit earlier about travel. I mean, T&E, uh, you know, typically when you have, for example, your sales force is, you know, hopping on a plane and like, that's very costly for a lot of early stage companies or fundraising, in fact. Um, and, you know, what we're seeing now is everyone being pushed to virtual. This is actually a huge cost savings for a lot of companies. So, you know, the question there too will be when, as everything sort of turns back on, will we go back to a world where we're hopping on planes and spending on teeny? Or perhaps would this be a fundamental change where startups in particular can actually remove that sort of line item from their budget and say, you know what, we're just going to be doing these meetings virtually and it might be a, a long-term cost savings. So um, the time will tell, I suppose. That's great. That's great. Thank you, Meredith. Um, okay, I um, we are at the uh, let's see, ten uh, minutes till. Um, for the three of you, is there any closing remarks? I thought the questions that came in today um, were fantastic and really kind of hit upon the growth um, mode moving out through the pandemic um, to be conservative, but also. Um, looking at 2021 uh, for growth. Um, is there any last comments or suggestions that you would like to make to the founders that are on the call right now? Um, I would just like to say that per the comments from the other panelists and on behalf of Lighter, we're all still active right now. We're all still looking to, to fund and support the ecosystem. So there is capital out there outside of the PPP EIDL that people were looking for in the prior months. So there's definitely a path to find capital. Um, so, you know, don't assume that there are no options. You know, um, if, you're, if you still have a good business and a good underlying business, um, it's something worth reaching out and seeing what you can do. Because as Meredith pointed out earlier, some businesses are actually faring very well in this environment. And it could be a great opportunity to capture market share and continue that growth. Or it could be an opportunity to shore up the balance sheet and extend runway. Excellent. Yeah, man, I would, I would echo that. I mean, I think, um, you know, recognizing that it's hard for everybody right now, um, you know, it's, it's important to figure out a way to see your way through what is, you know, kind of a, a, a corridor that we don't know if there's, you know, kind of how far the light is, the end of the tunnel or how far that tunnel is. And, you know, getting, you know, getting your, your P&L and balance sheet right to make sure you can sustain this period and get to the end of it is important. And so, um, you know, make sure you just have those conversations with alternative sources of financing to, to position yourself best to get through this. And maybe I'll just say, you know, we've talked a lot about the nuts and bolts of business here, but um, this is also a really challenging time for so many founders as it is for investors. And I think uh, maybe my message would be like, be kind to yourself, you know, and uh, exercise compassion with your team and try and, you know, bring your team together because, uh, you know, sometimes these businesses are short, but um, relationships are long. So I think, you know, it's really important to invest in the relationships with your family, friends, investors, and your, your own team as well. And just um, take care of each other and take care of yourself during this really difficult time. Thank you, Meredith. And thank you very much uh, to the three of you. I know that you have uh, busy lives that you lead. Appreciate your um, your recommendation and your open, transparent honesty to uh, the founders out there and helping them with their businesses and looking at different funding options. Um, thank you. And for all of you out there, um, I do want to share with you that the Founder Series will continue. Um, on July 9th, we are hosting a webinar um, featuring our ebook on uh, looking at the cost of capital and reviewing different alternatives there. Um, this ebook just uh, went onto the market a couple of weeks ago. Forbes magazine just picked it up and ran some articles on it. Um, great amount of information. So if you would like a copy of this, please send a quick email to us. Um, you can also see it on our website and we'd be happy to send it to you. Um, thank you all for attending our founder series. Um, and stay healthy and safe out there. Bye-bye.